why those folks are missing the point. out you're out in your seat ready fortunately everything is digital now and it doesn't automatically so uh, one thing I wanted to talk about before we really got into our our topic this morning is um, as you know this this week is is election week and um, this is a big big time for us as Christians a big time for us in our nation and um, I just wanted to give a couple of of thoughts, not that there's any shortage of people giving their thoughts right now, right? Um, but just uh, a couple of things as a church that we need to remember. First of all, um, we need to pray. Um, first and foremost, this is a time in our nation that, um, as Christians, our battle is not going to be done with our keyboards. Our battle is not going to be done with our mouth. Our battle is going to be done on our knees in prayer. And... Um, we need to pray and pray fervently, especially these next couple of days until the election. The second is that we must vote. That being said, um, there is there's a time, regardless of, of how you view this, we have to understand that everything that we have been given, we are stewards of. Whether that is our money, our time, uh, if God gives it to us, he expects us to use this for his glory. And as we look at this in our nation, and not every nation has this, but we have been given the additional gift and chip issue to be used ultimately for the glory of God. So this is something that we ought to prayerfully approach, but also with responsibility. And, and you know the story of the parable of the talents. Two guys used their talents, their what they had been given to steward with, glory of God. And they were rewarded for that. The one that chose not to, opportunity in our nation to vote. So this is a matter of stewardship that we want to utilize. So I, I just throw that out as a, a uh, responsibility that we have this. And, and in that ability to vote, I hadn't thought about this until this week, and I was reading some different things, and leadership, governmentally. But one day a year, and that is our election day, of our nation, we select the leaders that we have. And I want you to think about that in those terms, is... is they now answer to the voters. You follow what I'm saying on that? So we are the ones, as a representative democracy, um, voting. And as leaders, we have to look in the scriptures and see what do the scriptures say about our responsibility as Christians on those times. And we must lead with integrity, with character, with compassion, but also with wisdom. So as we go into this week, it's challenge to you to look at those things. And last of all, trust God in the outcome. Um, obviously, none of us know how this is going to go. Most of us have an opinion on what we want to go. But how many times life? It hasn't happened in my life. Sometimes it works out, sometimes not. But we have to ultimately trust that regardless of who is elected, our king is Jesus Christ. So as we look at this, we have to recognize and remember that this is the kingdom that we are in right now. But there is a kingdom that we answer to that is a higher kingdom. And that's with Jesus Christ as the king of kings and the Lord of lords. So I just wanted to front end this. I didn't want to just say, hey, you know, it's election week, so go vote. But I wanted to give you a couple things to think about as we go into this week to, to recognize that this is our stewardship responsibility, that we need to pray, but also trust God 
in the outcome. So there's actually a little bit of this that we're going to get into in our sermon today. So um, we're going to dive into our passage today. Um, we're calling today's sermon to live and to love. And um, in our passage today, there are going to be some commands on how we ought to live and how we ought to love. So um, because of that, I titled it to live and to love. Um, I'm really creative with sermon titles here. Um, that's why you never, hardly ever hear them. But I have to put something at the top of it, so I have to save it in Microsoft. Twenty-five. Since you call on a father who judges, I miss foreigners here in reverent fear, for you know that. from your empty way of life, handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him, you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him. And so your faith and hope are in God. You purified yourselves by obeying the truth so that you have sincere love for one another, love one another deeply from the heart. For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God. For all people are like grass. All their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word endures forever. And this is the word that was preached to you. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word today. We thank you as we recognize what you have given us. You've given us your word. You've revealed yourself through your word. You've given us freedom in this nation to meet together. You've given us the authority to vote. God, as we look at today, we, may we not complain about what we do have, but we recognize what you have given us. Be good stewards and responsible with those things and glorify you with every blessing that you have bestowed upon us. So we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Well, as we get into this, um, this is a, a really good passage. One of the things that I want to say before we get started is what, sometimes we get into these passages about how we ought to live. I think sometimes we, we look at these through this mindset of, of uh, well, I have to do these things. And if I do these things, then I make God happy. And if I'm not doing the right things, then somehow God's not happy. And by what I do, I earn favor with God. And, and I want you to know that we do not earn favor with God by what we do. We earn favor with God by what Jesus did. I want you to think about that. Because what we do, this is a result of who we have become. And, and as we go into this and we start talking about the ways we ought to live, I want you not to go to this place of, being a Christian is about do, 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 and I have to do all of these things. It is about living out who Christ has made us to be. And I want to use a verse before we get started. It's in Philippians chapter 2. It says, therefore, and we read this a couple of months ago. Remember Philippians? And all of a sudden, as I'm going through these, all these Philippians verses are coming up. And that's what happens when we go through these books of the Bible. It's just like, to me, it comes alive, and it's awesome. So, therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence. Continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Comma. Okay? So sometimes we look at that and say, live out, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. So go and work and work and work and work and work. Comma. God, who works in you to will and act in order to fulfill his good purpose. So whose purpose is it? God's. Who is it that works within us? It's God. Now, we don't just passively sit here and say, God, I want you to consume me and control me, and I just stand here and wait for God to move my feet and move my hands. No. You see, God does not control us, but it is us that recognize who God has revealed himself to be. We look at his will that he has revealed to us, and we recognize that this miracle of salvation that he has given us, we respond in this way. So... I'm, I'm, I'm kind of stumbling over my words trying to say this and understand it correctly. But um, the result of our faith 
is the necessity to do things and to live and to serve him. It's like a flower. Ultimately, you have the plant and it grows and develops into a flower. Faith within us develops into works. And if we don't have the works, then what James says is, is it right to question the faith? Absolutely. Because faith naturally revolves and evolves into work within our lives. And, and if, we, if we try and have faith without works, then you really look at this and say, has God really changed your life? Because we have this miracle of being born again, becoming a new creation in Christ. And when he died on the cross and we respond to his, his act of, 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 of death on the cross for our sin, we become something that we were not before. We are resurrected. We are born again. We are a new creation. And it is a miracle what happens within us. And how we go on to live from that point is, is an absolute miracle that God has done within us. If you are a Christian, you have experienced a resurrection and a new miracle within you. You are not who you were. You were bought with a price. So the result of that new life of God living within us is living a life that is honoring and glorifying to him. And Jesus, he knew the hearts of people. He saw people that God was working through, and then he saw people who were just living it out. And you can see this through the, the Pharisees. He called them hypocrites. He said they were empty tombs. They were full of the good works and doing all the right things, but their hearts were far from him. They were all works, but no faith. But the people who responded with faith, people like the woman at the well in John chapter 4, People that, that Jesus saw the woman that touched the hem of his garment. He saw faith. And it was glorifying to him and glorifying to God. So as we go into this, I want you to know as we talk about the way we should live, I'm not saying that you are earning favor with God or getting bonus points or gold stars on your name in heaven. This is the result of who we are. And this is the encouragement from scripture to live in such a way that we bring glory to God. Is everyone absolutely confused? No, okay, I think I'm saying stuff. I think you all understand it. But this early service stuff is early. There's no coffee. Right? It's tragic. It's almost unchristian. Um, so we're going to break down this passage. Um, three things of how we should live. Exhortation. One. I got number one wrong. Did I get it wrong? Number two. Live as foreigners. Okay, so 1 Peter 1, 17. Since you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. So this first verse, and, and uh, as I was reading through this, I want to give you a little breakdown of how I approach a scripture and how I, I look at it and try to break it down. So whenever you see the word like you, since you, I, I want to ask the question, who is you? And as we look at the, the, the book of First Peter, we know First Peter was written to Christians that were exiles scattered throughout ancient Turkey is basically where they were. But we also know, and we talked about this last week, that Peter was overseen by the Holy Spirit as he wrote this letter. And it was Peter writing the letter, but the Holy Spirit ordaining the words to say exactly what God wanted it to say. So that way, it isn't just written to the people in ancient Turkey. It's written to you and to me. So as I see this verse, I see, since you, the original audience was in Turkey, but the intended audience was for Christians all throughout history. That's you and me. Since you call on a father, who is the father? God, okay? We call on a father. And, and I thought, that's kind of a weird way to say that. You know, I've heard... Scripture, and I talk about, you know, this is God, this is my Savior, this is, this. but I call on the Father. I don't use that language very much, and so I was looking up what that word means, and to call on someone, or in this language, is to invoke, or to ask for protection from, and, and when we look at this, we call on our Father. We ask for protection, and ultimately it leads to this picture of salvation. We call on God. We call on his name for salvation. This is who we are. We are children of God. So as we look at this passage, this includes you, this includes me. And he says, since that is us and this God that we serve judges a person's work impartially, 
He judges our work. He judges our work. So we must do what? Live out our time as foreigners here in reverent fear. So the first command for you and for me as we serve God is to live as foreigners. And what does that mean? And, and I think we can all nod our head and say, oh, okay, live as foreigners. Here's what this is. Our kingdom is in heaven. As soon as we became saved, as soon as we experienced this miracle of rebirth, of becoming a Christian, of placing our faith in Jesus Christ, we were adopted into a different family. We became citizens of a different nation. Now, we live here temporarily, but that is our home. What's the old song? This isn't our home. We're just a passing through, right? And that is the reality of who we have. We have a king. And that king is Jesus. He is our Lord and our Savior. And we live here as foreigners and exiles. This isn't our home. So I just wanted to take this time and, and, and look at this, this election. That not it so much fun to see all of the noise? And, and we all get caught up in all of the election stuff. And I just want to give you just a little touch of reality of what this means for us as Christians. I had a friend a long time ago named Charlie Couch. He's still, uh, he's from like North Carolina or something. He talked like the guys that live out in the hills and had a kind of a drawl to him. Not like a Southern drawl, but like a, an East Coast drawl. Anybody familiar with that? Like he'd be out raccoon hunting and like that kind of a guy. So, and he actually did raccoon hunting with dogs and all that stuff. So kind of had to talk, like, you know, like that. I, I am terrible with accents. I'm not even going to try. Um, Anyway, I don't remember what my situation was, but I was sitting down talking to Charlie, and he, he said these words. He said, what is the worst possible outcome that could come from the situation that you just described to me? And I'm thinking, man, oh. And, and you know how your worries and your fears go. And, and you think the worst possible scenario. I'm like, well, I could lose my job. I might lose my house. I might, you know. And, and you kind of start to play this out, and he says, okay. Let's just say you're in that spot. You lose your job. Can you get another job? Well, probably. If you lose your house, can you get maybe another place to stay? Well, yeah, probably. So you're not going to be jobless. You're not going to be homeless. You're not. So the worst possible scenario in this situation is you're not too bad off, right? I'm like, yeah. And he said, and how likely is it that the worst possible scenario that you're worrying all about happens? What is, what is the likelihood? Well, maybe not so likely that the worst possible scenario, but I'm still scared of the worst possible scenario. So, so if the worst possible scenario isn't all that bad, you shouldn't be too worried about it, right? I'm like, all right, old guy, wisdom, got the lesson, right? And, um, and I really valued that. And as we look at this time, and I'm using this because this is where we are right now. This is where every one of us is right now. I, I want you to think through this in this way. If as American citizens, we lose every single right, every single freedom. We can no longer meet together as Christians. If we, you know, let's go to the worst possible, there's a totalitarian leader that becomes a dictator and, and completely strips away everything that we have as a nation. The Constitution, the Bill of Rights all just go out the window. And we live in this terrible, horrible nation that has become of what that would go to. I want you to think about that scenario. As a Christian, I will still live a full and abundant life. I will still have peace and hope and love and joy. I will still be in this place where I have a confidence in my God. Can you, do you follow what I'm saying? Because my hope and my peace and my joy are not found in my government. They are found in my God. So the worst possible thing that could happen here, what is really stripped from me? Nothing of who I am. Do you know why? Because I'm a foreigner here. This isn't my home. That is my home. Heaven is my home. Now, should I be uh, like concerned about the affairs that happen here? Absolutely. I'm not saying that so that we just uh, minimize all of this stuff. This is important. But this is not where I have my hope. This is not where I put my foundation on for my life. This is not where I, I have my security as a person. My security as a human being comes from the one who died for me, not the one that's complaining on television for me. You, you follow what I'm saying? I'm a foreigner. You're a foreigner. 
And when you watch the news, can you actually say right now, praise God, I am a foreigner. Oh, man, I, I am. I, I, I am so grateful that that is my home, not this. So number one, we live as foreigners. Number two, we live redeemed. We are redeemed. We must live like we are redeemed. In uh, 1 Peter 1, 18, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect, he was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed to you in these last times for your sake. I was thinking about this word redeemed this, this week. We live as exiles here. We live as as foreigners here, because we know that we have been redeemed. Now, I was talking with a couple of folks and just trying to grasp the word redeemed, okay? This is like one of these church words. If you're in church, you know the word redeemed, and, and you throw that word out, and we, oh, I'm redeemed, we're redeemed, and we sing songs about being redeemed. But we never really sit and think about, what does that word mean? It's like uniquely a church word and it's not used anywhere else. And it's like our church code language that we just throw out these 50 cent words because we're in the church. And I was thinking about it. How would I put this in terms of how someone else might understand what the word redeemed means? And I was talking to Annie. She's in the office this week. And, I was like, and she was saying there's two different words that we have to understand as we process this. Number one is worth and the other is value. Now, I want to talk about worth as you and I as human beings. We are all created in the image of God. We all have this worth. We have the fingerprint of God upon us. And I don't care what a person believes, what a person thinks, whoever they are, if they are walking by on the street, you look at them and say, they are an image bearer of the almighty God. They have worth. Would you agree with that? Good. But value is something that's different. Value is something that, that changes because we have sin in our lives. And what he's saying in this passage is, is that it was not through perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed. And these are the ways that were handed down to you from your ancestors. And as we look at this, how do we work to improve our value? And there is a way of this world to redeem yourself and to add value that you did not have before to yourself. And people work to redeem their lives with money, with jobs, with pursuing all of these things, trying to get prestige, trying to find a way to redeem their lives with the things of this world. And almost every person out there, if you put a definition to redemption without using the word redemption, how have you put value into your life that you never have before? They will say, well, I did this, or I did this exercise program, or I did this self-help book, or you know what I'm saying? And they look at themselves in some way, shape, or form as redeemed from some version of themselves five years ago, ten years ago, or even three months ago. But it was with the ways of this world that they redeemed themselves. Which ultimately, can you redeem yourself? No. No. This verse is saying is live redeemed because it was not through these things that you are redeemed. It is through the blood of Jesus Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect who died on the cross and gave me value, value I didn't deserve, but value that I cannot have replacing anything else. It is completely washed away everything in my life. It is a value that only comes from Jesus and from nowhere else. I am redeemed. I have value now be, that I never had before. Certainly I had worth. But because of sin, I had so broken my life. This is the story of you. This is the story of me. This is the story of all of us. We are redeemed. But our redemption doesn't come from the things of this world. It doesn't come from going to church. It doesn't come from following the rules. It doesn't come from all of this stuff. It only comes from Jesus Christ. And recognizing that my value comes from who God has made me, or my worth comes from who God has made me, but my value comes from the work of Jesus at the cross. I live in such a way, knowing who I am, understanding my identity is not something that I built, but it was given to me by Jesus Christ. We 
We are redeemed. We live redeemed. We're not seeking value from the things of this world. We recognize the value has been given to us by Jesus at the cross. Does that change the way we live? Absolutely. The pursuits of this world just don't quite hold the light and luster that they once did. Because we have been given the light. So the third command on how we live is we live with faith and hope. And this starts off with kind of a, a, a therefore. So through him you believe in God. We have been saved. Our salvation comes from God who raised him from the dead. This is Jesus. This Jesus who died on the cross and glorified him so your faith and hope are in God. Now, if there has been one theme that we have had from the beginning of this corona pandemic stuff till today, if there has been one theme that has virtually been in every sermon that we've preached, in every conversation that we have had in church, it has been this. Our hope cannot be found in this world. Our hope has to be set on the eternal things. Our eyes have to be set on the things that do not change. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now, I want you to tell me one thing that is the same yesterday, today, and forever on this planet. There's not, is there? Where am I going to place my faith? Where am I going to place my hope? In the one that can hold my faith and hold my hope and not abuse it and drop it and spin it around and make me get stay, you know, all of this stuff that we deal with in this world. As a result of Jesus Christ, because he is my redemption. Jesus Christ, because he's given me an identity. I'm a foreigner here. I don't live by these things. I have my faith in him and my hope in him entirely. Once again, going to Philippians, how, how Peter describes this. It says, you believe in God who raised Jesus from the dead and glorified him. I want you to think about this in these terms. Philippians 1. Who, by very nature, God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking on the very nature of a servant and being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. You see, is God becoming human, submitting himself to death, even death on a cross, and taking on all the sin of humanity devaluing him through the sin of you and through me. And as a result, that's where you were. That's where I was. The God, the resurrection God, re exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every other name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So we live with faith and hope because we have a God who will glorify himself through Jesus, but will glorify himself through us as well. He glorified Jesus and one day we will be glorified as well as we bring glory to him. So this is our hope, this is our faith and it's placed in Jesus Christ. So, we move on into this love section. So we live as foreigners, we live redeemed, and we live with faith and hope. Make sense? Are you guys tired or, oh my word, I am tired. And, and uh, But you were singing really good, so I'm kind of wondering, is it warm in here? I, I'm warm, I'm really warm. But I'm glad because it's cold outside, but anyway. So those are three ways to live. Now there's three ways to love. And this is going to be found in, in uh, verse chap or chapter 1, verse 22. Now that you have purified yourself by obeying the truth. How are we purified? By obeying the truth. And how, how did it just say we're purified? By the blood of the Lamb without blemish, right? By obeying the truth. What is that? By putting our faith in Jesus Christ and allowing Him to redeem us, to buy us back. To put value within us. Now that this describes 
you, the you that we began this passage with, not the you that's just in Turkey in the ancient days, but the you in Newport today, in Pine Ridge Community Church with real life Newport and all the confusion that comes along with that. At least we serve the same God, right? Praise God. That hasn't changed. Now that you have, been, have purified yourself by obeying the truth so that you have sincere love for one another. The first command here is to love sincerely. Love sincerely. It doesn't say that, that this is what we do. I want you to read this. So that you have sincere love for one another. If you are saved, there is a natural result within our heart that takes place. You see how that is worded? That if you're saved, that means you have a sincere love for one another. A sincere love. This is how we are to love. Our response to God is not by acting in a certain way, but living out who he has made us to be. And, and I love this word. I, I typed it out, so I'm going to butcher it. It's the Greek word for love sincerely. It's anupokritos. That sounded pretty good, right? Anupakritos. You want to say it so you can wake up? Yes, you'll never remember that again and probably never use it again. But it means to love without hypocrisy. And I thought that's an interesting way to say that. To love without hypocrisy. It's not to love in a special way. You know, you've got like phileo and agape and eros, all these different loves that it talks about. This is to love in a negative way. Do not love with hypocrisy. And it's an interesting way of saying this. And I was thinking, what does that mean to love with hypocrisy? I mean, what's an example of someone that would do that? And as I think through the scriptures, Jesus in the book of Matthew says, don't pray like the hypocrites. What do the hypocrites do? They stand out on the corner and pray big words and big loud prayers so everybody hears them. And then everybody hearing them pray, what do they all think about that person praying? Oh, what a holy and righteous person. He even prayed in the King James. He must have extra credit with God, right? And we look at that and we say, that's a hypocrite. He's not praying to God. He's praying to be heard by everybody around him. It says when you fast, don't fast like the hypocrites who make themselves look just miserable so everybody around them knows they're fasting. Are they fasting for the glory of God or are they fasting so people around them see it and think that they must be holy? That's what was going on and honestly that's what happens in the church oftentimes is, is we want our holiness to be seen and if we believe somehow within us, let me rephrase this, there are times that I believe within myself that if you believe I'm holy, then I must be holy. Do you follow that? That my holiness isn't even connected to the holy God is by what the people around me must think that I look like. We are to love without hypocrisy. That means whether people are watching or whether they're not watching. It isn't about the people around us or even the people being loved. It is about the condition of our heart loving in the way that God loves us in an unconditional manner regardless because this is the God that lives within us that lives through us. Do you remember it is God that lives and acts within us to accomplish his purposes. It is that God that is loving those that are around us. We must love sincerely. The next word is to love deeply. So we're going to continue in 122. Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth so that you have sincere love for each other, love one another deeply. Well, does that sound the same as sincerely? I love you sincerely. I love you deeply. They sound very similar, right? They're not. They're actually two different Greek words. And I didn't look this one. Oh, I did look it up. Okay. Ectenis. Like tennis with an ek in front of it. I don't know if that... Ek tennis is, is what that Greek word is. And it literally means to love with all of your strength. You know, there's another command that we have to love with all of our strength. And what is it? Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength. 
We are to love the Lord our God with all of our strength. And now Peter is saying, when that God that we love is living within us, he has redeemed us, he has changed us, we must now love the world around us with all of our strength, with your hands, with your actions, to love the world with everything that we have. And the third command to love. So we must love with sincerity, love deeply, and love with a pure heart. This this verse ends. Now that you have purified yourself by obeying the truth, so that you have sincere love for each other, love one another deeply from the heart, literally with a pure heart. The purity that comes with us from heaven is the purity that we love one another with. And it's God that purifies us. And he's in the purification business. So he guides us and leads us in our love. So this passage continues, verses 23 through 25. Have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and enduring word of God. I don't know if you've got your Bibles in front of you or if you've got your electric Bible on your phone. That needs to be underlined. This needs to have highlights on it. This needs to have stars written next to it. This is who I am. It is not through the perishable of this world. It is not through the temporary that gives me value, that brings me redemption, that defines who I am. It is not about the perishable. It is about the imperishable through the living and enduring word of God. Where do I find who God is revealed to be? Through the word of God. It is God's revelation. And in fact, in 1 Peter chapter 1, if that word reveal has shown up a couple of times, if that's keyed in on you. In fact, it's a very strange thing. In 1 Peter chapter 1, the word reveal shows up five times. And it's all about God revealing himself, his will, his purpose, and his way to us as human beings. If you want to know this God, and you don't know him, you look at how he has revealed himself through his word, through his son, through his activity, as he reveals himself in his action in this world. First Peter chapter 1, the entire, if you were to boil it down to one theme, it is this, God has revealed himself and his purpose to me and to you. And this is how. We have not been born of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and enduring word of God. All people are like grass and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall. ago I did a study and this was probably about when I started preaching and because I wanted to know what preaching was most of you know I didn't take any classes on how to preach I'm figuring this stuff out just as much as you guys would if you were in my seat and um, so I looked in the New Testament for the word preach seems like a good place to start right and this was one of the verses that I came across And I remember thinking about this verse, just saying, well, as long as I preach the word, I'm on the right track. And that's my hope and my prayer, is through a pure heart to preach the word and allow the word to preach to your heart. This is, I mean, and you've heard me pray before our services, after our services, and and this is my prayer as we go into scripture. Is I truly believe that you are here because the Holy Spirit brought you here. I don't believe anybody comes except when the Holy Spirit draws them. I believe that God is at work in your life today. That is why you are here. I look at the scriptures. This is not the scripture as revealed by Jared. This is a scripture that is overseen and authoritatively written by the Holy Spirit. The same Holy Spirit that brought you here today. And how is your heart going to be changed? It is through the work of that same Holy Spirit that will speak through his word into your heart. There is no amount of my preaching that will convince you 
that you should live in a certain way or follow a certain God. That is God's work that he presents inside of your heart. My job is just to stand up here to put words into this room that the Holy Spirit can then use for his purpose and for his glory. This is all about him. It is about our obedience, but completely about his work in this place. This is why we preach the word of God. Because it is, the, it is used by the Holy Spirit because it was written by the Holy Spirit to people brought by the Holy Spirit to speak to your heart and change your life by the Holy Spirit. This is why we are here. This is what he has done. And if you're here today, I mean, it ought to put a smile on your face because God has already won. He is already doing his work and he's continuing to do his work. And as we look at our hearts and look at our lives and the Holy Spirit is saying, hey, you ought to consider this. This is the person that you haven't been loving in a very good way. This is a way that you haven't been living. You've been living for the things of this world, consumed by the things of this world. And I'm reminding you to put your eyes on eternal things, not temporary things. As he's doing that, you're not responding to me. You're not doing things to become a better person. You have the Holy Spirit living inside of you, guiding you. So take that step. It's obedience. And it's what he's called us to. So as we close today, I want you to know our redemption doesn't come from the things of this world. It doesn't come from your church. It doesn't come from reading a book or anything like that. Your redemption is eternal and it comes from the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. So as we leave here today, we know that there is a way to live. This isn't our home, that is. So that's where we put our faith. That's where we put our trust. He has given us that value through redemption. And now as a result, we go out and we love. With all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, we love our God and we love the world around us. You know, I was thinking about that love as we close here. Um, if it was a checkbox... Like if you have all the right information, if you have all the right answers, and, and this is something that I struggled with. Um, man, when Lisa and I got married, it was like we had started going to church and really recommitting our life to Christ. And I was like, man, if I just learned more, if I had more answers and I studied the Bible more and read, read more books and I had all of the answers, I might even be a Bible teacher someday. And when everybody asks a question, I could be the guy that answers those questions and I could be smart enough and have all the answers and all the questions I would have are answered. And somehow I thought if I got smart enough and read enough books and learned enough theologies and all of this stuff that anytime someone came, God could use me because I have all the answers. Do you know how many people have come up to me and knowing the job that I do, have come up to me and said, hey, Jared, can you give me a better definition of grace? Not very many. Because God didn't call me to get smarter. He called me to love. Now, do you know how many people have responded to me loving others? Dozens and dozens and hundreds. And, you know, you look at this. My, it's not about how I equip myself. It's about how God equips me. And he equips me in my heart. And that does play over. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't study and learn and improve. But understand that that doesn't gain a status. God will use a heart that is willing to love. More than a heart that has all the right answers and is ready to tell everybody how to live. So that's where we're going to close today. And I want to thank you. Like tremendously thank you from the bottom of my heart for being here. I, I was kicking around this week. It was actually a little discouraging. Like, how much is too much? Bouncing from one place to another in an online service. And then this week we're in that place. And that week we're in this place. And we're here and there. And how much is too much? And I was just praying, God, I, I, I don't want to lead poorly. I want to lead in obedience. It was almost like God was speaking in my heart saying, it's my church, not yours. Don't worry about it. These are my people, not yours. I'm the shepherd. You're not. If I lead, the sheep will follow. This is his church. And I just want to just take a minute and thank you from the bottom of my heart for being his church, for being his people, for following him. This isn't about a logo on a wall. This isn't about what church, what this or that. This is about being his people, his flock. 
So I just wanted to take a minute and thank you for that. We're going to close in prayer. and As we close in prayer, if God is working in your heart, if there's anything that you have a prayer request about, if there's um, this topic about redemption and what it means to be saved and redeemed by the blood of Jesus, if you want to understand what salvation is, I want you to talk to me after the service. We've got our connection cards. You can fill one of those out. You know to fill out the prayer request or anything like that, but I just want to close in a very simple prayer and thank you for being here, but also thank God for doing his work in his body. So let's pray as we close. God, I come to you today with so much gratitude. There's so much that we are undeserving of. So much that you have done and, and we just approach your throne with humility and joy and gratitude. I pray that you'll be with our nation. I pray you'll watch over us. I don't know how this is going to end this week, but I do know that you're in control. So may I keep my eyes on you. As each of us go home this week, that, that we would live lives that glorify you and honor you in everything we say in everything we do. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen.